So Steve Jobs died this month at the young age of 56. Many people in this country die at a young age. We all know something about the vital signs of a person, their blood pressure, their temperature, their pulse, and other measures that are typically taken when you see a doctor or go to the clinic. I worked as an emergency doctor for 30 years, and a person's vital signs told me how fast I had to act. I was told that a person was brought in with a blood pressure of 260 over 140 and was comatose, I'd be there in a heartbeat. If the nurse told me that someone was in the next room with a normal temperature, pulse, and blood pressure and was complaining of dizziness for six months, I could take my time. We have a sense of vital signs for a person and what normal means. They're called vital signs because they say something vital about a person in a medical setting. We're not taught in this country to understand the vital signs of a nation. That is, to ask about the health of its inhabitants. It's not discussed in high school, nor in the coursework that trains us to work in a medical setting. But there are standardized ways of looking at the health of a country, just as there are for an individual person. What are the vital signs of a nation? One is the average length of life, how many years people live. That's called life expectancy and can be applied to any population, be it a country or a city or a county. All you need to calculate what is, that is knowing when someone is born and when they die. Steve Jobs was born on February 24, 1955 and died on October 5, 2011. If we know everyone's birth and death days, we can determine age-specific mortality rates and calculate life expectancy. Another important national vital sign is the infant mortality rate, namely what fraction of babies born die before reaching the age of one. We can also look at how many children born die before reaching age of five, the child mortality rate. What about the chances of dying in the prime of life after you've survived childhood? There's a statistic, 45Q15, that represents the probability of someone who's reached his or her 15th birthday dying before reaching the age of 60. Sadly, Steve was not one of those who got to celebrate his 60th birthday. Given all these numbers, we should ask, what is a normal life expectancy, or a normal infant mortality rate, or a normal chance of a 15-year-old dying before reaching age 60? What does normal mean in that context? If we take the example of vital signs of a person, blood pressure, for example, today, is normal, normal is 120 over 80 or lower. When I was a medical student in the, in the early 1970s, we didn't consider someone having high blood pressure unless the first number was over 130. And then we thought that normal blood pressure rose as someone got older. Back in the 1940s, we considered having a high blood pressure as a sign of a healthy heart, being able to push blood stronger. President Roosevelt died of the consequences of very high blood pressure in 1945 that caused a stroke when he bled into his brain. These days, we don't want people to have high blood pressure, so we give them drugs to lower it. So what's a normal life expectancy for a country like the United States? The United States spends almost half of, all of the world's health care bill, and health care spending per person represents about 18% or almost a fifth of our total economy. So we might think we have a long length of life. We do live longer than we used to. To know how long we live, we could go to the Central Intelligence Agency's World Rankings website. Our CIA has great intelligence and displays that online. On that site, life, for life expectancy, we find the United States life expectancy is 78.37 years. That's really very high. That's long. So we must be getting good value for our health care dollars, which will amount to almost $9,000 per person. But when you go to that website, you have to scroll way down to find the United States. We're at number 50 there. Many other countries have higher numbers for life expectancy. That is, their people live longer lives. Gibraltar, for example, lives longer than we do. It's just a rock, so it, it should be around for a long time. But keep scrolling up, and there ahead of us is Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
Wasn't there a war in Bosnia and Herzegovina that started in 1991 with the breakup of the former Yugoslavia? And before it ended in 1996, there were unspeakable atrocities committed with huge losses of life. Yet they're the healthier than we are, as are all the other rich countries. The sad truth is that we die younger than people in close to 50 other countries, at least according to our CIA. What about infant mortality? Go to those tables and the ranking is not much different. More babies die in the first year of life compared to over 40 other nations. In fact, three times as many infants die as the healthiest countries. Even Cuba does better. For the chances of dying in the prime of life, 45Q15, it's the same story. You have to sleuth a bit more to find the numbers using data from the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation or found in Lancet, the world's leading medical journal, and do some spreadsheet work. You find for men, we rank 44th, and for women, 48th. A boy, age 15 in Peru, has a better chance of living to age 60 than a boy in the United States. A girl in Sri Lanka has a better chance than a girl in the United States. I'm glad for Peru and Sri Lanka but sad for our nation. So the tragedy of Steve Jobs was not so unusual for we the people in the United States. We die younger in the prime of life than people in close to 50 nations, including some that are poor countries like Sri Lanka and middle income countries like Peru. The unusual thing about Steve dying that doesn't fit the picture is that he wasn't poor. He was our favorite billionaire who gave us the MacBook Air, the iPod, the iPhone, and the iPad. But the people who die younger than they should in the United States tend to be poorer than those surviving to age 60. Being rich is no guarantee of a longer life, but it sure helps. If you want to be healthy, the numbers suggest it is better to live in another country than the United States. And you may say, I don't want to live that long. I just want to live a happy, fulfilled life. Maybe to you, quality is more important than quantity. But since we spend so much money in the last few years trying to live a, even a few days longer, we really do value the length of life in the United States. Steve Jobs had a liver transplant and much sophisticated medical care trying to live longer. When it comes to quality and happiness rankings, we don't do much better than in health rankings. In fact, happiness in the United States has been declining ever so slowly over the last 40 years, and women have suffered the greatest declines. That is true for so many other indicators on quality of lives lived or our well-being. Namely, things aren't so good here, again, if the standard is comparing ourselves with others. Why do we die so young? Turns out that medical care doesn't do that much in helping a people in a country live longer. I often try to use metaphors about how little medical care does. I've learned a new one about a dripping faucet that I'll present later. I tell people to ask, do you want health or health care? Turns out we don't have either in the United States. Our health has more to do with the stress in our lives especially stress in early life, from the time you're conceived and before you go to school. As we go from the erection to the resurrection, it is the first thousand days from conception to age two that are most crucial for being healthy. In those early years, about half of our health as adults is programmed. As a nation, we don't have policies to make those first thousand days healthy ones. We don't have paid leave policies for pregnant women. All the other rich nations do. That is, for women who are pregnant and working for a job at pay, for pay, they get time off with pay. Because of the stress working at low-wage jobs without control, pregnant women are more likely to deliver a low birth weight or premature baby or to require a C-section delivery, a cesarean section delivery. What about paid leave after your baby's born? There are only four countries in the world without paid parental leave policies. Papua, they are Papua New Guinea, 
Liberia, Swaziland, and guess who else? Every other country has a law guaranteed paid leave for mothers. We don't. Instead, we preach family values. Just tell the mom and dad to work hard at their job if they have one and be good parents. Moms and dads have to work, many often at very stressful, low-paid jobs just to make ends meet. We have the most poverty of all rich nations, and today we have a higher proportion of people in this country in poverty than at any time in our history. It is the poorer people who die younger for the most part because their moms and dads don't have the time to parent. Poverty kills. Not only does it kill the poor, it shortens others' lives, including that of Steve Jobs. Poverty kills. Remember that. Another way of looking at why we die so young is that we tolerate incredible inequality in the United States. That is the reason we don't want to spend money on families or children or on poorer people in America. The rich, who call the shots here, say that everyone should have to work hard to support their families. We have the most inequality of all rich nations and the worst health. The two are closely related. Economic inequality is bad for our health. A study from Harvard University published in 2009 suggested that one death in three in this country is caused by our big income gap. One in three. That means 880,000 excess deaths a year because we have so much inequality. That's a killer fact. Namely, we have 880,000 deaths a year in the United States linked to our income inequality. It's like a 9-11 tragedy happening every 30 hours, every day and a quarter, continuously throughout the year. The violence of the Twin Towers collapsing haunts us, yet we're unaware of how economic inequality is killing us. It's a form of violence that is invisible, there's no smoking gun, and people die from the usual illnesses. It's called structural violence. Let's explore inequality, the cause of this form of violence. How unequal are we? What was the income of the highest paid person last year? We all know what the minimum wage is, but hardly anyone can tell you the maximum wage or the amount that the highest earner makes. We're not supposed to pay attention to that. Last year, the highest paid person made $10,000 every 15 seconds or about $2,450,000 an hour, or $4.9 billion a year. That's nice work if you can get it. And as the Gershwin song says, you can get it if you try. We believe that if we work hard, we can achieve anything, including making billions of dollars a year. That belief is killing us. Inequality is at record highs. Some people in this country are starting to question whether so much inequality is good for us. Presidents, starting with Reagan, preach to us that we should let the rich take all the money they can, and they will invest it and create jobs for the rest of us. The trickle-down concept. But the only thing that's trickling down on us these days is the yellowish liquid coming out of rich bladders. <laughs> that isn't producing health in America. We die young for being pissed on in the USA. The frenzy that has had us helping the rich get richer than they ever dreamed possible may be coming to an end. That is the second point I want to make, namely, we are in the midst of a political revolution, not a rapid, violent revolution where we see people dying from gunshots, drone missile strikes, or bomb blasts, but one proceeding at a gentler pace with the violence coming from the unequal structure of society. The world order, as it has been since the Second World War, is no longer serving the needs of we the people, whether we leave, live in the United States or Greece or in Egypt or in Pakistan. The old world order is collapsing. In various parts of the world, people are massing together and protesting in ways they haven't done before. Just as we're behind in our health status compared to other nations, we're late in entering this revolution, but we've started. Our protest today started on Wall Street where the crisis began in 2008. 
I was surprised that it took us so long to begin to question our political structure and the capitalist hysteria that was giving everything to the rich, even when Wall Street was on the verge of collapsing. Remember just those few years ago when we abandoned any concept of the free market and turned to socialism as we bailed out the rich? It's difficult to calculate how much we gave the rich as part of their bailout package because those hogs are still feeding at the trillions trough. As we gave them trillions, they paid themselves billions in bonuses and we didn't ban an eyelash. The free market doesn't apply to the rich. The rich always need our help to stay rich. But that is changing. Last month, a small group of protesters known as Occupy Wall Street began in New York, New York. At first, the media paid no attention, but the protests are growing and spreading around the country. Occupy Seattle, with thousands protesting in solidarity with Occupy Wall Street and other cities, has resulted in police crackdowns. That's the nature of the protests at this stage. If you draw attention to your issues by the police becoming involved, the media will then report the demonstrations. The protests are using social media in the same way the Spring Awakening in the Middle East did. At this point, there's no sense of where the protests are heading. But, no one, has, but one has to understand that there's a limit in the United States to the amount of democracy that will be tolerated. We see this all the time most obviously in the Battle of Seattle 12 years ago when the police were brutal. The Trilateral Commission's 1975 report titled The Crisis of Democracy was very specific that you can have an excess of democracy. That was what the title meant. Namely, the crisis that comes from people taking democracy seriously in the 1960s, I was a part of those protests in the 1960s, and if I learned one lesson from that era, it was that you can't become complacent. You can't think the struggle is over when you get some media attention or tossed a crumb. The only thing the rich and powerful have wanted throughout history is everything. They don't stop in their quest, so we can't stop stopping them. So I have nostalgia for the future that's hard to predict. What's going to happen? When and how? Let's recall the past to get a to better understand how we got here, so we can have nostalgia both ways. You here know about as much as what's going on in our society and what needs to be done as the experts who brought us the crisis. So what is happening in, now in the United States, Latin America, and Europe? Well, the last time we had, there was this big a crisis of capitalism was 75 years ago. And the response was to create mechanisms by which the government took care of ordinary people. The reason that happened is that people organized, unions were vibrant, and there was an excess of democracy. This resulted in progressive legislation such as Social Security and the New Deal. That previous big crisis of capitalism was preceded by the biggest polarization of wealth perhaps ever seen when the richest 1% held close to half of all the wealth in this country. The response to the New Deal legislation and economic justice policies that followed was the richest 1%'s wealth declined to having only 23% of all the wealth by 1975. The rich saw it coming. So they began organizing back in the 1960s to get their wealth share back. Keep that number, 1%, and its difference, 99%, in, in your mind, since we are in the 99%. There's a global 99 too, so the problem just isn't in the United States. Back in 1946, the highest tax bracket in the United States was 96%. Hard to believe, but true. I sometimes show students front pages of the New York Times. On April 28, 1942, the headline read, $25,000 income limit asked by president. Roosevelt proposed a 100% tax on all incomes above $25,000. That didn't pass, but a 94% tax passed that was later raised to 96%. Today, it's 35%. What has happened to the values in our nation since then? 
Well, the key values in this country in the 1950s produced a GI Bill and low-cost housing loans, and it went as far as the Family Assistance Plan in 1969, which made the lead headline in the New York Times on August 8th. It was to provide a guaranteed income for every American family. Imagine a Republican, President Nixon, proposing that. The legislation passed the House and languished in the Senate, and when Nixon got embroiled in Watergate, it never became law. We're now back to greater levels of wealth inequality than in the 1920s. How did they do that in the United States? They distracted us into thinking of individual pursuits rather than organizing together. We got in line to be one of the first to buy an iPad instead of demonstrating on Wall Street. That's changing today. President Reagan said we should help the rich get richer and something will trickle down. And I remember in the 1980s how crazy this seemed. You know, the yellow rain that trickled down then is still dribbling on us today. By preaching taxation as a bad thing and the idea that we can all become rich someday, we bought into this. Many workers today believe the rich shouldn't pay taxes because they believe they'll strike it rich before they die. What happened with our crisis that burst forth three years ago is the result of processes set in place four decades ago as the richest 1%'s wealth share plummeted and the 99%'s wealth increased. In the last 40 years, our wages have not increased in inflation-adjusted dollars. The rich said their wealth share had declined so much that they weren't going to pay us more in wages, and they accomplished this in a variety of ways. The automated production using technology and computers. After World War II, the uh, United States was about the only producer, but as other countries got up to speed, U.S. companies faced competition. So they got legislation passed to offshore production to remain competitive, which is hard, which is why it is so hard to find a made in USA label anymore. The only thing we've made recently is the global economic crisis. It's definitely made in the USA. We no longer make useful things here anymore. But the only thing we make and export are military weapons. The lack of a manufacturing base will make any economic recovery jobless unless we rethink work in our society. The rich supported waves of immigration of people who would work for less to undercut wages. And women entered the workforce in huge numbers and now outnumber men. To understand the scale of the changes, back in, the, in 1970, the median family with two parents and two children had only one parent working outside the home and had more disposable income, that is more money to spend on vacations or entertainment, than a median 2,000, that is a Y2K family, with two kids and both parents working. Besides putting more family members to work, another way was to use consumer credit that became very easy, so in effect you could borrow your salary. You paid yourself from home equity loans that led to the housing bubble and from credit card debt, which reached record levels. During this period, the United States went from being an industrial economy to a service economy and financial services became prominent. And many U.S. corporations got into banking. Back in the 1950s and 60s, organized labor was one of the biggest financial contributors to the election process. But now the biggest contributors are big corporations, so they have much more influence, while ordinary people have had very little sway and much is, is, is the same is true of organized labor. Political lobbying became a huge industry as the number of lobbyists uh, since the 1970s increased over tenfold. Yet ordinary people, or the homeless, or the poor, don't have their own lobbyists. They can't afford them. So the poor or the homeless get no benefits. Only groups with highly paid lobbyists get noticed in DC. Our democracy has become transformed so that corporate lobbyists masquerade as elected officials and we have the best democracy money can buy. We should call our system a corporatocracy. An example is General Electric, a company I remember as a child. We bring good things to light was their slogan then. Today, their line is, imagination at work. 
how does their imagination really work? GE has grown immensely and last year made worldwide profits of $14.2 billion, with $5.1 billion of that coming from its U.S. operations. Yet their U.S. tax bill for last year was a credit of $3.2 billion. They made $5.1 billion in profits and we paid them $3.2 billion as their tax credit. GE doesn't do much business with light bulbs anymore. Much of its profit comes from the banking business. It has offshored many tens of thousands of jobs. Last year it spent $4.1 million on lobbyists. That's what the invisible hand does. It gets lobbyists to waive it so that GE doesn't pay any taxes. Furthermore, their CEO is, chairman, is the chairman of President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness. Our vote is no match for the power of the corporations. So neoliberal reforms came into being in the last decades that privatized something once it became profitable. Massive subsidies for many industries and technologies were put in place that benefited the rich both directly and indirectly. Unprofitable research was paid for by the government and when it becomes profitable it is handed over to industry. Prime example is the computer industry. I worked with computers in the 1960s at a time that IBM and control data were heavily subsidized by the military because no profit could be made. By the late 1970s, the technology whose development we paid for through our taxes came to be used by visionaries such as Steve Jobs, who could take that technology free of charge and create Apple Computer to make computers work for us. The internet was similarly developed by the U.S. Army and in the late 1980s given away to industry, so today Google makes obscene profits. The modern commercial passenger airliners are basically modified military bombers that were developed entirely at taxpayer expense and now Boeing makes huge profits. Costs are socialized, profits are privatized. Neither Apple nor Boeing had to pay license fees to we, the people, who paid for the technology they used to make fantastic profits. These neoliberal reforms have required cuts in spending for social services such as education, public transportation, even national parks. At the University of Washington, where I teach, increased tuition fees and pay-as-you-go programs are now becoming more common. Another reform was to deregulate, since the market and the invisible hand is considered the best regulator. Among key deregulations were those policies put in place in the last great crisis of capitalism, especially the Glass-Steagall Act. It was passed in 1933 to separate investment banking from commercial banking and was designed to limit speculation. These important protections were slowly whittled away with major emaciation in 1980 and ending with a bill that repealed the act in 1999 signed by President Clinton. Now banks could gamble with depositors' money and create new instruments such as derivatives, credit default swaps, and many others that generated enormous amounts of virtual wealth on the order of hundreds of trillions of dollars. The housing bubble that came crashing down in 2008 was just the tip of the iceberg of a crisis of capitalism. Capitalism has this remarkable ability to sell us its mistakes. What we've been doing since then is giving the rich ever more and making sure they don't pay for any of the problem that they created. Naomi Klein wrote Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism in 2007 saying that during a crisis, the rich can push through all sorts of legislation that benefits them. You saw that happen during the Made in America global crisis beginning in 2007. Banksters received the bailouts, not you. Another example of the shock doctrine at work was the Extreme Court's 2010 decision on Citizens United that allowed corporations unlimited spending to influence the political process in the United States. The corporate influence in the future will become ever more powerful and opaque since now they don't have to disclose their spending. What happened after the crisis in the United States? We bailed out the rich to a huge amount 
Estimates range in the trillions, with some around 10 to 11 trillion dollars. But somehow that was not enough. And now we're being told we need more austerity in order to lower the national debt. The rich want everything, and they're willing to gamble even their security and health in that quest. So capitalism is selling its favorite failures back to us. Some people wanted to hedge their bets on the bubble and profit from it. So last year's highest income earner made $4.9 billion as a hedge fund manager. He bet on the falling housing market and made tons of money. Compared to the minimum wage in Washington state, that's an income gap of almost 400,000 to one, a world record. Yet nobody's upset at that. All of you in this room likely paid more tax last year than the highest income earner did. So capitalism will come out on top of us. We thank the invisible hand for this providence. We need to rethink whether or not we want to be slaves of the market and of capitalism. Now limits are, are, are emerging in the United States. In February in Wisconsin, there was the biggest support for organized labor since the 1960s. And now Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Seattle and Occupy Tacoma and so, and so many other places are active throughout the country. These demonstrations will grow as we generate crises to our advantage instead of to the rich. Today, people in this country are confused and not knowing where to turn since the rich are trying to hold the front of the battle by any means they can. These include getting the corporations to spawn the Tea Party to distract people from core issues. We have corporate astroturf, where corporations pay companies to blog and tweet as individuals with extreme right-wing views. People think this is what others believe, so they begin to change their perspectives. The media continues its focus on individual stories, singling out the unfortunate and distracting us from the big process that's going on. Celebrity gossip holds sway. Telephone hacking, while symptomatic of corporate malfeasance in Rupert Murdoch's empire, becomes a scandal of individuals rather than being presented as an example of the decay of capitalism. There's a transition in the commercial media from major analyses of what is going on to focusing on bringing consumption back to its previous levels. I read the New York Times every morning. It's changed immensely. So now a more accurate name for it would be Better Homes and Gardens of Ultra-Rich New Yorkers. <laughs> they had a special 12-page section 10 days ago titled Wealth. It was all about how the rich can get more wealth. Maybe it should be renamed the Wealth Times. Independent journalism is fast disappearing, so now we have a press corps. People say the internet is replacing the press corps, but search engines tailor what you get when you search to your own proclivities. Two people sitting next to each other making the exact same search get different results that are designed to please each of them separately. Most of us get news from the web, and that comes from aggregators, secondary sources who give us information tailored to our own personal interests. So Google News or Huffington Post employ computer algorithms to troll the web and give us the stories that contain key words appearing in the first 25 words of the story. We're more limited now in how we see the world than when we used to turn the pages of a newspaper and glance at various headlines. Social media has become incredibly popular, in, but in this country it's not being used for progressive purposes the way it is elsewhere. So that may change. What is happening elsewhere? In Latin America, beginning in the 1980s, people began to question the neoliberal perspective and started popular organizing. So today, the most progressive governments and activism are taking place in Latin America. They didn't suffer so much from the economic meltdown in 2008. We should look to them for ideas. In Europe, the rich saw their situation deteriorating. In the US, the rich were just doing so much better that the European rich decided to craft policies that were bound to fail, especially in Ireland, Spain, Portugal, and Greece, so the, the rich there could profit. Then the rich began preaching austerity to the less fortunate in various ways. They wanted to raise the retirement age in France from 60 to 62. 
in Europe, people live to wor work to live and want to enjoy life, whereas we live to work. Now that our unemployment rate is so high and we're unhappy, but people in Europe expect benefits from their governments when they don't work. We don't. Germany is a country whose economy hasn't tanked because they were not focused on consumerism. The people have pushed to have green power by 2022 and not depend on any nuclear plants. Greece, with their pensions and civil service jobs, is presented to us as a people with crazy demands because our pensions are so low or even non-existent. We laugh at their demands and ignore the massive demonstrations. In England, college tuition used to be free, and now they're charging tuition at universities, and that produces massive protests. Debt in Europe is seen as something taken on to invest in the future, something we used to do as well. But the rich there see the opportunity to cut benefits to ordinary people as a means of paying back the debt. But Europe's ordinary people say to the rich, you brought us this crisis, you're not going to make us pay for it. So millions take to the streets in France, Greece, and England, while our media downplays those efforts. How the so-called debt crisis will be resolved is unclear. European out banks outside of Germany are pretty shaky now. The ones in the US should have followed market principles and collapsed, but they were too big to fail, so capitalism sold us that fiasco. We're fitting in the epileptic, epileptic seizure of a new world order. In Northern Africa and the Middle East, there have been massive uprisings linked to the repression of the past 30 to 40 years. The rich and powerful are scheming to get their power back there. The military in Egypt are in control today, and it's unclear if elections will happen in the next few years. Libya will continue to fester for years, but there's business euphoria about moving into profit there. Japan had a disaster in March, producing the nuclear meltdown from the tsunami. Because Japan had been trying to get the economy out of recession for a long time, they were planning to give corporations there a tax holiday. But after the tsunami, the corporation said they would forego the tax breaks so the government could use the money to rebuild. Can you imagine such a thing in the United States? <laughs> what is happening to rethink capitalism? I used to think that people in the United States were lugubrious and not looking at what was going on, but that's not true. We aren't buying the stuff we don't need with money we don't have the way we used to. Having all the latest gadgets or the newest clothes we only wear once or twice, or cosmetics plan uh, promising hope in a jar, or two garage cars isn't what life is all about. Because we're not spending money we don't have frivolously, business has less demand and thus less reason to produce goods that we don't need. No one's hiring workers, at least poor workers. And this is today's rut. Americans are smartening up and realizing that it isn't stuff that makes you happy or helps you live the good life. But we don't know where to turn. Many of you remember Bob Hope and Johnny Cash and, of course, Steve Jobs. Think of Bob Hope, Johnny Cash, and Steve Jobs. Today, there's no hope, cash is gone, and we've lost jobs. <laughs> the expert who made all this happen had been useless at changing the situation, except in ways that benefit the rich by trying to jumpstart the engine of economic growth. The world is unstable. Climate is changing. Human populations are growing. Food production is tenuous, and we're running out of water where it's needed. In rethinking capitalism, we must recognize that economic growth has raised our standard of, of living as much as will benefit our health and well-being. More growth will not be better for us nor better for the planet. We desperately need to think, start thinking of a post-capitalist system or structuring an economy that will benefit our lives. The economy as it's existed over the last 40 years doesn't even benefit the rich and powerful in this country. Recall in June, the big media event in the United States was a congressman sharing pictures of his crotch on the web. However, the most important information that came out that month 
came from the University of Washington's Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation and showed that length of life is now declining for women in close to a third of U.S. counties. Life expectancy is declining for women in close to a third of U.S. counties. Their study was shared with over a thousand media outlets, yet no one has heard, has heard that our wealth as a people in this nation is at a crossroads. They found that even our healthiest populations were no match in the Health Olympics for whole nations. Think of it. You believe that whatever matters to other people doesn't affect your health. If you do all the right things, eat healthy choices, exercise, have a personal trainer, take your supplements, and see your doctor. You think those are the critical factors affecting your health. But whatever you do pales in comparison to what happened to you in those first thousand days. You can't change that. It's programmed into the expression of your DNA so that you will have type 2 diabetes or hypertension or coronary artery disease or breast cancer or most of the chronic diseases of aging that plague us. Yes, do the healthy individual stuff. Steve Jobs did that. But without society making the right choices for the first thousand days, you are doomed. Steve Jobs' biographies suggest his first thousand days were troubling. So even if you're rich, you're not immune. Other studies show that our rich are not as healthy as ordinary people in much of Europe. It's hard to see what's happening during our major revolution that will take a long time to, to unfold. Only afterwards will history books tell us what happened. To understand this, think of past scientific revolutions. The media revolution began by changing the copying of manuscripts by hand to using the printing press. That was strongly resisted and it took hundreds of years to take hold. Now we're in a new state of that revolution as we transition from printed page to digital format. The Copernican revolution where we came to see the sun at the center of the planetary system rather than the earth also took hundreds of years to be accepted though it didn't matter to us, except conceptually until we tried to launch rockets to the moon and other planets. Capitalism took hold with the Industrial Revolution hundreds of years ago. The focus on economic growth really only began 75 years ago when Simon Kuznets proposed a new measure, the Gross National Product, or GNP, as a new goal for the U.S. government in the 1930s to increase economic output. The GNP became the indicator that was followed. We got what we measured, a focus on economic growth, producing more goods and services. That might have been a good idea back in the 1930s, but it isn't what we should be looking at now. What should we be measuring today? That should be the topic of global discussion. Where do we want to go as a species on this finite earth? I think the measure should be for everyone to have enough of the basics of a good life, one that's sustainable and doesn't create havoc for the planet. We need to focus on economic justice. We will see a post-carbon economic transformation. This requires rethinking many aspects of society, namely how we're organizing ourselves and what we focus on. Among the concepts that require rethinking are the nation state as a unit of organization. Does it serve human welfare? I don't think so. Corporations as entities, especially now that corporations have the rights of individuals forever, whereas our rights are gone when we die. Steve Jobs has no more rights, but Apple has theirs in perpetuity. We don't live that long as individuals in the United States compared to other countries, so that needs fixing. Locally controlled enterprises may be the answer to big corporations. We need to rethink the small units we associate with, the family, the community, and society. The community and society needs to scale down in size in order for our voices to be heard and for, man and for making manageable decisions. We need to become societalists. How our time gets used and whether technology is making our lives better and what sorts of technology really matter for that? We need time to interact face-to-face -face with one another. 
We need to think mon rethink money and finance, since money today is really debt held by banks. Is that in our best interests? Future transactions may need to be locally based, perhaps on barter. Latin America is soundly rethinking capitalism, which produces a lot of tension there between those who are too rich and those who don't have enough. Economic inequality is, de is declining in Brazil and in some other Latin American countries. It's really healthy to be engaged in those ideas there. I think Europe will be better able to manage this revolution because there's more vibrant political discussion there, both on the streets, in the workplace, and in home. In the United States, we have people in my age range who can remember the turmoil of the 1960s and the sense of a purposeful society dedicated to creating the good life for all. In the 1960s, demonstrations supported the civil rights movement, the opposition to our military engagement abroad, and asked what the purpose of our democracy was. Today, we have a large segment of young people who sense that their lives may not be as good as those of their parents. They're trying to figure out what the world will be like and what they have to do to survive. Perhaps we need those like my age cohort to interact with the youth and work together, old and young together, and sweep in the middle. Learn from Steve Jobs, who can teach us as a role model. As a youth, he was visionary and developed a basic computer, then enhanced it at, to a Macintosh that we drooled over because it was so cool. He then suffered failure as he was cored out of Apple. He didn't dwell on his mistakes, but kept trying and coming up with new ideas and new ways of seeing things. His passion brought him back to Apple, and he took over the helm, not trying to make bank, but getting paid only a dollar a year. He wanted to innovate so much that he would accept a dollar a year as his pay. Jobs was not a capitalist. The lesson there is do what you love, the money will follow. He never focused on making money, but on making a difference in the world. And he commanded our respect right to the end. Apple as well was not driven by the market forces of capitalism. The innovations Steve Jobs spawned were not driven by the invisible hand of the market. Jobs saw the reason that the hand was invisible was that it wasn't there. It was just an illusion created by capitalism. Steve was driven by innovation, by a vision, an inspiration, rather than the iron fist which is ubiquitous in capitalism. The result of his energies was all this I stuff. Do we need them? At this point, in so many facets of this revolution, we can't tell. Yes, I stuff is there if you want it and have the money to buy it. The global 99% don't have the means to acquire all these I things. That's not right. That Steve Jobs died so young reflects the health of our, nation, of our union. We don't want that for our children and grandchildren. To contemplate why Steve died so young despite having so much wealth that he could get the best medical care possible, consider our health condition in this country as a, as a water faucet. Being sick is like the faucet dripping. In our nation, the faucet drips a lot. Water drops are constantly coming out. We have a vast profitable medical care system to wipe up the drips. That is what doctors are trained to do. They take a tissue and wipe up a drip. As soon as they do, there's another drip that needs to be wiped up. Doctors are taught in medical school to decide how best to catch the drip before it lands in the drain. The United States is sick and the drops are big and heavy, and it costs a great deal to mop them up. Not just the older drops, but the younger ones like Steve. Even a gold-plated, diamond-studded nanotissue only wipes up a drop that has already leaked out of the faucet. What we need is another strategy that stops the drops rather than cleans them up. You know what the solution is. Just don't, just don't uh, look above the faucet and reach up and turn off the tap. Then the drops stop. So what is the handle to turn off the faucet? Turns out to be the strategies that make the first thousand days healthy for the mother, the fetus, and the family that raises the infant. The mother's key. 
A girl is a mother from the time of her own conception. What matters for our health is the health of our mothers before we are conceived. Turns out your grandparents are important too. So are dads, but their influence, once you've been conceived, tends to be less since we all spend the first 270 of the thousand days inside our mothers. We can't, we can't escape that. So what are the strategies to turn off the faucet? To improve our health in the United States so we don't die so young, so that youthful deaths like Steve Jobs are less common, we have to focus on early life issues these first thousand days. We need time to be under less stress while we're inside of our mothers. Our parents need time to parent without all the stress that we have in the United States, which has some of the highest levels of stress of all countries. How can we lessen the stress for our mothers when we're inside and for our parents after we're born? Do what other countries do. A person who knows only one country knows no country. That's a critical idea. A person who knows only one country knows no country. So we can learn from countries that have better health than we do. What do they do to be healthier? I've already mentioned paid maternal leave policies. Let only Swaziland, Liberia, and Papua New Guinea be the only countries without a paid maternity leave policy. All the other rich nations give paid antenatal leave. Namely, women who are working outside the home get paid leave for several weeks and as, as much as 12 weeks. Studies show it makes those first nine months healthier. We need to focus on early life and pay time off to be pregnant or to parent as the first major medicine we need. Some people call this social medicine. I see it as vital medicine. It's vital to a healthy society. How are we going to pay for that? Many possibilities. We could tax corporations at the rate they used to pay in the 1960s, about five times the rate now. We shouldn't have to compensate GE $3.2 billion as their tax credit. We could increase taxes on the rich, who pay proportionately much less tax than they did when we were healthier compared to other countries. We could introduce a progressive consumption tax. We need to begin discussing strategies. There are only two superpowers left in the world. One is the rich and powerful that control huge military might and awesome weapons of both mass destruction and mass distraction. They number at most a few million. The other superpower is vast, numbering six billion. I'm not talking about you here and all around the world. We have to recognize our collective superpower status that will only come when we work together. Being physically together as in Tahrir Square in Egypt was a good example of sensing superpower status. Other countries in the Middle East have responded as well, as did the people in Europe. Collectively, we're a threat to the rich and powerful. What can we do? We've already started by not moving the consumer muscle as much as we used to. Now we need to exercise the citizen muscle. You can start by becoming involved in Occupy Your City demonstrations. Besides just going there, letter a big sign about something that's important to you. Be ready to speak to reporters about your sign. Consider wearing a costume. Dress up your dog. Take pictures of what is going on and post them on your sites. Talk to others about what you did. Ask them what kind of nostalgia for the future they have. We need to understand what's going on. And there are three levels of understanding. Most of us perceive this as a problem. We need a rational way of understanding what the core problem is and why it happened. Then we need to respond, to use some strategy to deal with the problem. We need to develop a response ability. Our responsibility can take a variety of forms. We can talk in our families, at work, in our communities, in places such as this one, and especially face to face. We can demonstrate in public places. Despite all the technology at our disposal, acting face to face is the most effective response. We need to ask the right question. Far better an approximate answer to the right question, which is often vague, than an exact answer to the wrong question. The rich try to distract us, as Thomas Pynchon wrote, 
if they can get you asking the wrong question, they don't have to worry about the answers. If you don't ask, you don't know. And if you don't know, you can't act. We can blog, we can tweet, we can use social media. But these media won't help us work together unless we also have face-to-face -face discussions. We need to use both in new ways, and there's no recipe for success here. We're drowning in information, yet starving for wisdom. Mark Twain said, it ain't what people don't know that worries me, it's what they know that just ain't so. <laughs> to paraphrase Twain, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> Consider things not with a grain of salt, but with a bucket of salt. Misinformation abounds, so use your critical thinking skills. Seek out those who can synthesize, who can put together the right information at the right time and think critically about how to make important choices wisely. Great things always begin from inside. Think of an egg. If an egg breaks from outside, the life inside ends. But if it breaks from inside, life begins. So great things happen from the inside, and we need to get inside of the issues and break out. Today's crisis is a terrible thing to waste. The rich and powerful have been using it for their ends. We need to create a new crisis for our own ends by amassing in public places in huge numbers. We need to use such a made in USA crisis for the benefit of we the people on this earth. We can't rely on hope. Hope is an opiate like heroin. We have to rely on ourselves to work together. Solidarity is the best medicine. The way to fight organized money is with organized people. The way forward will depend on acting. That is, is on doing something and then doubting whether or not it works, then acting again, perhaps differently, and doubting whether that works or not. The metaphor of the political right and the political left may not serve us. You can't fly a plane with just a right wing or just a left wing. We'll always be setting a correction as we move forward. Gandhi said, you may never know the results of your action, but if you, didn't, if, if you do nothing, there will be no results. We won't know what the outcome of this process will be for a long time. The history books will write it up. But in the meantime, don't be missing from the action. Demonstrate or die.